le festival d'un pays qui a une si prestigieuse tradition littéraire. Le monologue intérieur, no es sencillo hacer una película. Sonaba su chat clásico disolviendo las gafas. Para los chicos y para los grandes. Podemos expresar lo que queremos. Mi cuerpo argentino pretende ser irónico. El escritor lo es siempre de la literatura que falta. Hay una cuestión geográfica en la circulación de la literatura, una cuestión de mapas y fronteras, ciertas rutas que lleva tiempo recorrer. Hola a todas y a todos, bienvenidos. Muchas gracias por estar del otro lado en este Filme Online 2020. Estamos muy contentas de la lectura que vamos a presentar a continuación porque está a cargo de una autora que admiramos muchísimo y que hace mucho tiempo tenemos ganas de que esté en Filba. Por suerte, este año nos dio el sí. Me estoy refiriendo a Sharon Knowles, poeta norteamericana que tiene más de 10 libros de poesía en su haber. Empezó a publicar aproximadamente en la década del 80 y en castellano contamos con muy buenas traducciones de algunos de sus libros. Acá tengo solamente dos en la mano. La habitación sin barrer con traducción de Inés Garland. La materia de este mundo que es una compilación de varios libros de Sharon Knowles, una compilación que hicieron Inés Garland junto a Ignacio y Tulio y que también tradujeron. Sharon Knowles va a conversar ahora con Inés Garland y luego va a hacer una lectura de algunos poemas que ella seleccionó y estén atentos porque varios de esos poemas se traducen al castellano por primera vez para esta lectura en Filba. Es domingo, el festival recién está empezando, así que quienes no se han suscrito aún a nuestro canal de YouTube, no dejen de hacerlo, no dejen de mirar tampoco toda la programación que está disponible en la página web de Filba, filba.org.ar. Tienen día por día, hora por hora, todo lo que va a pasar de acá hasta el 24 de octubre. Y recuerden que todas las conversaciones de este festival pueden seguir en redes con el hashtag Filba2020. Así que esperamos sus comentarios y su participación. Los dejo ahora con Sharon Oates y con Inés Garland. Muchísimas gracias. Hello, Sharon Oates. We, we are so grateful to have you here in the Filba and we are so lucky to have you. I am really excited about the, the prospects of interviewing you and talking with you and You have so many readers in this country that have discovered you and, and love you. And each day I discover groups of people that are studying your poems, that are sharing their life experience through your poems. You probably know that this happens, that you, that you are a light to many people's lives, that you do this. But it's, uh, it's amazing. It amazed me uh, uh, when, when I see it happening. It's, it, it's really a lot of people who are reading you all over the country and, and in the rest of South America too, thanks to, to, to the translation. So I'm very happy to have you here and I thank you thank a lot. You. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So let's um, let's go straight because I don't have too much time. So I want to ask you: um, um, you have I, I heard you uh, quote Chekhov in in uh, when he says, "Others made me a slave, but I must squeeze the slave out of me, drop by drop." And I, I wondered. That's amazing. I don't think I've ever heard that before. Oh, I'm you did. proud if I <laughs> check off, but um, it, it's very, uh, I, I think we all can identify with that. Yeah. Well, yes. I, I, I wondered um, how did that, how did poetry do that for you to, to squeeze the slave out of you drop by drop? Well, I think if one tries as an artist to squeeze one's own small truth, out of oneself into language, then, uh, 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 then one is not being a slave at that point. One is um, being oneself. Uh, 
Yeah, I was raised in a very strict, old-fashioned atmosphere, especially for uh, women. And um, just just to try to give one one small person small truth while singing for pleasure. Um, I think that then, uh, yes. I mean, uh, there was a lot in my childhood about being a servant in relation to religion and to parents. So, um, yeah, so it's a matter of status and class and uh, the, the wild desire to have any freedom in any way, whether we're dancing or writing or speaking to each other. Yeah, and, and how did you discover that that it was through poetry that you would that you would achieve that freedom? Well, I don't think I thought I would. I mean, ah. I to work to work for that. Yes, I was very lucky. Also, I had education, and I had some time to just dream and and write. No, I didn't do it because I thought it would succeed. I did it because it gave me pleasure and I had to, I wanted to, I wanted to. I didn't want to be the same kind of people that some of my ancestors were. I can see that, yeah, I can see that. Um, now this next question has a bit of a long introduction and I'm sorry about that, but, but uh, it's more, of a conversation, maybe. Um, I don't That's know if you're familiar with Alice Miller. Yes. Oh, you are good. Well, you know she um, she maintains that experience has taught us that we have only one enduring weapon in our struggle against mental illness: the emotional discovery and emotional acceptance of the truth in the unique and individual history of our childhood. And in her books and in her practice, she introduced the fundamental concept of enlightened witness. And this is the enlightened witness is someone who can empathize and support someone and help them to gain understanding of their past. And I believe you are an enlightened witness. I have seen people cry in the, in readings, and I have seen how, and you have probably seen have a lot of this in your life. People coming to you and telling you what happened when they they heard your poems and how touched they were, and how they they were helped into their own acceptance and their own emotional uh, trip, whatever it was. I'm sure that happened a lot, and. Uh, you will be reading late poem to my father. And oh, can I have that poem, Jenna? Late poem to my father. Yes. Uh, is, <laughs> I'm sorry. This is the list that they sent me. So, um, and and I related it to um, also to this relentless and very desperate poem called Saturn. Yeah. And and so I wondered what. What did it take to make that journey from the relentless and desperation to compassion? Well, I think probably both of them were in me all the time. Yeah. And I think the kindness that one might receive at one time from someone in one's family is in one uh, so that I did not have an early life of unmitigated gloom at all. There was so much beauty in music, in flowers, in dance. And also, um, uh, I think people who unwittingly do harm to other people can still be lovable. Oh, yes. Uh, in their own way. So I think I was lucky that... I loved the people I was close to as well as fearing them and and deep down feeling some uh, anger at, at them as well. 
but mostly I was just trying to get along, you know, and yeah. uh, have fun when possible. And yeah, yeah. So I don't think it was a change in me. I think one poem, Saturn, focused on one thing. Uh, and then late poem to my father, which Jen is going to find for me, uh, focused on something else. I think both were always there in me. Yes, I, I thought so. Yeah, you you harbor both feelings all the time. We have that, no, the, these these contradictions and and yeah, okay. Um, and then, um, do you remember uh, any poem that made you feel vulnerable after writing it? Surprised by what you had discovered in it? This this uh, this journey of self discovery that that uh, that writing brings to, to writers. Do you remember one maybe that you could now say, don't worry if you don't, huh? we can cut the question all together if it's too difficult or? I think sometimes those have not been my best poems. Oh, really? Sometimes there's a balance, isn't there, between trying to find out, trying to tell the truth and, and making something that has its own integrity. So I know sometimes I've been moved by the ending of a poem of mine, and it's turned out not to be one. It's more moving to me than uh, I think it will be for other people. So there's, there's that balance um, between hmm, feelings and, and the shaping of feelings into a little being, a little poem that uh, has its own force maybe or most of mine don't most of my poems do not work no one yeah, yeah i write yeah, a lot i i heard that that you write a lot and there's lots of of writing that you don't like afterwards and and what's the criteria for that well self-pity is an important <laughs> criterion to, to uh, uh, to, not to pass those poems along, just I guess it's energy, verbal energy, but it's some kind of, mm, it has to do with the feeling that it's truthful enough to my own experience. Yeah. You you must be aware that when, when, uh, when you translate, when I translate, uh, this music that you are so keen on, on, or you you have this thing, you listen, you you have the music, and the music sometimes is very hard to translate. It's a, uh, yeah. and and but the words that you use are so specific, are so they have a temperature. When I I have to to really look around to find the right words to say what you said and that goes beyond music so it's not only music it's also right. and and i wondered how you did that because to me it would be like having all the words there and having to to choose the one that goes deeper and is more to the point or because they are really something they really hit the target and it i cannot imagine how you do that with thinking about music only or how, how it is for you to, to, to do that? Yes. I'm, I don't think I think about music at all. I think uh -huh. I'm just a musical being in that I love to dance and to sing. And as a child, uh, 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 yes, those were great pleasures to me. So I'm not really thinking much when I'm writing, I don't think. The rhyme is going to draw me sometimes towards the wrong word. Sometimes rhyme will draw me towards an easy word. But mostly, I'm just trying to get, well, I'm not even trying. The poems that seem to me to work are when I've been able to stay out of my own way and just let the arm do the writing, kind of. I know that's not really what's happening. but not to be controlling too much because I want the truth from underneath, whatever it is, musical or moral or whatever, to come through. I can absolutely understand what you mean, yes. 
And, and then there's there's all this miscellaneous knowledge that you have, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about, <laughs> you, you have these words that come from anatomy and words that come from like the uh, unswept, unswept room that's uh, unswept floors <laughs> from the Roman mosaics. Uh, I wonder if you do lots of research or you're surrounded by books when you write or, or how is that? I'm, I, I don't do, I'm not aware of doing research. Um, uh, uh, I, I love to read the dictionary, but I'm usually not looking for a particular word. And I like finding out stuff. I'm, I guess I'm fairly curious. So finding out stuff about anything. And also, I'm, I, I see myself as, as rather ignorant for an educated person in that there's so much I don't understand. Uh, like, I understand almost nothing. Uh, <laughs> but it, I've realized lately my criteria for understanding may be, ho may be high, higher than I knew they were. Yeah. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, I feel. Uh, oh, let me just ask Jenna. Were you able to find it here? Yes, I put it just to the left. Oh, it's here. So, oh, it's 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 here. I have late home to my father now. Good. That's the list I got. That's why I thought you Absolutely. you were going to read it. But if you don't feel like reading it, don't worry. We can no. do whatever. Oh no. Um, no I thought that maybe um, you would tell us. Um, you, how did you decide to make the book odes? How to how you decided to write odes? I'm sure that the the listeners will love to hear that. I was traveling with my beloved boyfriend, and we went in a bookstore, and a book fell off the shelf, and it was Neruda's odes to uh, common things. I think. Yeah. And so we got the book, and I started writing. I, I never thought, oh, now I will write odes. No. But when we got back to New Hampshire, I, I wrote this poem called Ode to the Tampon. <laughs> it came into my mind because I was so full of admiration for his odes, to common things and his common things and mine weren't necessarily the same but um i never knew that once i started writing odes i would not stop it also was a good time for me to write i wasn't planning this but for me to write personal love poems that were not obviously personal this was not someone who really wanted to be written about at that time. <laughs> no. and, uh, so I, I didn't even know what I was doing, but uh, the, the love poems had to, they wanted to come out and they could come out in the form of an art form, odes. And I never looked up what an ode was because I suspected they weren't really odes. And I didn't want to know because I liked that word, odes. And I wanted to have a book of love poems that would not, uh, that would feel uh, uh, not uncomfortable to him personally. And the book is dedicated to him. It is beautiful. It's a, a book of gratitude also. <laughs> yes. Oh, Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Of course. Of course. Whoever helped us to love and be loved, you know, that's the, such a profound gratefulness that we all feel if we're yeah. so lucky. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. And, and uh, you read the rest of the time. What kind of books do you read? Well, I read the poems of my fellow poets who are in my workshops at New York University. So that is an influence that comes from the immediate present. Oh, yes. Yeah. During my life, I've read a lot of poems from it uh, all over, sort of, not really all over. Um, mm -hmm. it, 
and the poems meant so much to me when I was a child and when I was an adolescent and uh, the, the shape and form. But um, I, I, I don't, I don't read as much now, uh, except for uh, the work of the poets in my classes. And so therefore, and I can't write like that. You know, I'm too old, I'm from the past, I'm from another time, but I see what can be done. And I find, and that inspires me and impresses me. Yeah, and also I studied a bunch of languages. So the whole idea of translation, the idea of uh, just everything you're saying rings such a bell for me in terms of the impossibility of translating one over into another. And I loved what how that felt in my brain to be learning a new language. But now all I have left really is a certain kind of uh, American English. Yeah. Well, that's that's, kind of that's quite not bad at all. <laughs> but not but, exclusively, yeah. But I also think that if you study other languages, you do discover boundaries in your own language that you wouldn't mm. discover if you if you only spoke your own language, which is really interesting. And and and, and new words and 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 feelings and resonance that you were talking about uh, comes into your life when you when you study things that you don't know or or, or read languages that you don't know or listen. Yes. And and what what would you what would you tell your students not to do in poetry when they write? I don't know that I would ever know what to tell them not to do, but to tell them to do would be, and I, this is actually my advice, is to take their vitamins. <laughs> yes. Take care of themselves physically. Now, my sense is that alcohol and drugs are maybe not such good companions for writing, but, uh, you know, some people find them so. But mainly to fight self-dislike. That is a, such a good piece of advice. Because <laughs> <laughs> we all have it and we're all, oh, yeah. we are all limited by it. And, yeah. um, but mostly I just like to describe what they are doing that I think is working so well. And then, you know, I also will say what I think isn't working. I'm not sentimental just on one side. I'm sentimental on both sides. I can see that through your through your <laughs> poems. Um, okay, but but then uh, there's no. But then I I might rephrase that. What what do you look for in a poem when you're reading a poem? Well, if it moves me, then we're there. That's it. We're yeah. we're there. Uh, sometimes it might move me more but there might be some other quality that I think there might be a little more of. Once we get used to each other in a class, then we can say anything to each other. Uh, well, not anything, but a lot. So I just, I try to see, I guess, I shouldn't say I try to. When I see each poet as having their own language and music and subject, I really look at each poem by itself almost. I'm not a scholar or a thinker. I don't see trends in people's work so much. I'm kind of in the moment. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Would you say some kind of, of, of uh, truth, resonance? Yeah, sure. And, mm. and it, if it's not my truth, how interesting if it is moving me not just because i'm used to it or i agree but it, it's almost alive these poems are almost alive to be able to sense that that truth in the other person no in whatever the other person is doing right yeah That's well that is 
that is what happens to me every time I read your your poetry. So once again, I thank you and I leave you to your reading. And unless it's something else you want to say or, or. I think that in the time we have, that means that I will read eight poems. But if it's too many, if it turns out to take too long, we you can do whatever you like. No, you read you read all the poems you want. You feel like reading, and 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 then the girls will will just uh, edit, and they can edit out some of the things I said or whatever. Uh, but uh, you you be I don't know. Read whatever you feel like reading. We will be so happy to listen. Thank you, Ines, and thank you very much. If I let me ask you a question from behind my book. If I read like this, can you hear me? Perfectly well, yes. Because then I don't have to see myself. <laughs> I get it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The okay. Connoisseurs of Slugs. I'm going to start with a, a, a rather early poem. The Connoisseurs of Slugs. When I was a connoisseur of slugs, I would part the ivy leaves and look for the naked jelly of those gold bodies, translucent strangers glistening along the stones slowly, their gelatinous bodies at my mercy. Made mostly of water, they would shrivel to nothing if they were touched with salt, but I was not interested in that. What I liked was to draw aside the ivy, breathe the odor of the wall, and stand there in silence until the slug forgot I was there and sent its antennae up out of its head, the glimmering umber horns rising like telescopes, until finally the sensitive knobs would pop out the ends, delicate and intimate. Years later, when I first saw a naked man, I gasped with pleasure to see that quiet mystery reenacted, the slow, elegant being coming out of hiding and gleaming in the dark air, eager and so trusting you could weep. Uh, don't mind my shaking, I have a harmless tremor. Uh, yes, and now, that was from the dead and the living, and now from odes. There was a book that came out in the States by now some years ago, five, seven years ago, by E.V. Shockley, uh, and in it uh, there is a poem of hers called Ode to My Blackness. So this is Ode to My Whiteness, after Evie Shockley. You were invisible to me. You went without saying. You were my weapon secret from myself. Whatever I got, you helped get it for me. You were my ignorance. Because of you, I was not innocent. I did not see that. You were my blinding light. My dreams had a blank area in the center, taking up most of the screen they played on in my sleep, a blazing circle that blanked out the core of the scene. I thought it was my mother's violence, but it was you, too. You, the unseen fat which fed me in the wilderness. You, my Masonic handshake. You my stealth, you my drone, you my collaborator, you my magician's cloak of steam, you my dissembler, you mine, I yours, irisless eyeball, you my blindness, inspiration of my helpless act, you my silence, Evie's blackness a dancer, you another, the two of you moving together. Thank you, Evie. Okay. Oh, yes.
Here's a mother poem. The clasp. She was four, he was one, it was raining, we had colds. We had been in the apartment two weeks straight. I grabbed her to keep her from shoving him over on his face again. And when I had her wrist in my grasp, I compressed it fiercely for a couple of seconds to make an impression on her, to hurt her our beloved firstborn. I even almost savored the stinging sensation of the squeezing, the expression into her of my anger, never, never again, the righteous chant accompanying the clasp. It happened very fast, grab, crush, crush, release. And at the first extra force, she swung her head as if checking who this was and looked at me and saw me. Yes, this was her mom. Her mom was doing this. Her dark, deeply open eyes took me in. She knew me in the shock of the moment she learned me. This was her mother, one of the two whom she most loved, the two who loved her most near the source of love was this. She likes that poem a lot. <laughs> and from Stag's Leap, oh yeah, there's the stag. Poem for the Breasts. This is a book of the end of a long marriage. Poem for the Breasts. Like other identical twins, they can be better told apart in adulthood. One is fast to wrinkle her brow, her brain, her quick intelligence. The other dreams inside a constellation, freckles of Orion. They were born when I was 13. They rose up half out of my chest. Now they're 40, wise, generous. I am inside them, in a way under them, or I carry them. I'd been alive so many years without them. I can't say I am them, though their feelings are almost my feelings, as with someone one loves. They seem to me like a gift that I have to give. That boys were said to worship their category of being, almost starve for it, did not escape me. And some young men loved them the way one would want oneself to be loved. All year they have been calling to my departed husband, singing to him like a pair of soaking sirens on a scaled rock. They can't believe he's left them. It's not in their vocabulary, they being made of promise. They're like literally kept vows. Sometimes now I hold them a moment, one in each hand, twin widows heavy with grief. They were a gift to me, and then they were ours, like thirsty nurslings of excitement and plenty. And now it's the same season again, the very week he moved out. Didn't he whisper to them, wait here for me one year? No. He said, God be with you. God by with you. God by. God by for the rest of this life and for the long nothing. And they do not know language. They are waiting for him. My Christ, they are dumb. They do not even know they are mortal. Sweet, I guess, refreshing to live with. Beings without the knowledge of death. Creatures of ignorant suffering. Oh, late home to my father. That's a good time for that. This is from some time ago. 
late poem to my father. Suddenly I thought of you as a child in that house, the unlit rooms and the hot fireplace with the man in front of it, silent. You moved through the heavy air in your physical beauty, a boy of seven, helpless, smart. There were things the man did near you and he was your father, the mold by which you were made. Down in the cellar, the barrels of sweet apples picked at their peak from the tree, rotted and rotted, and past the cellar door, the creek ran and ran, and something was not given to you, or something was taken from you that you were born with, so that even at 30 and 40, you set the oily medicine to your lips every night, the poison to help you drop down unconscious. I remembered that child being formed in front of the fire, the tiny bones inside his soul twisted in green stick fractures, the small tendons that hold the heart in place snapped. And what they did to you, you did not do to me. When I love you now, I like to think I am giving my love directly to that boy in the fiery room, as if it could reach him in time, as if it could reach him in time. Uh, yes, back to Odes. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Ode to the Clitoris. Little eagerness, flower girl basket of soft thorn and petal, near the entry of the satin column of the inner aisle, scout in the wilderness wild ear which perks up, tender dowser which points, imp shapeshifter, bench pressing biceps of a teeny goddess who is buff, lotus for grief, weensy Minerva who springs full armored, molten, I did not know you at seven. I thought you were God's way of addressing me when I kept swinging on the rings after the bell had rung. He didn't use his words, he used you to get my attention. He wrenched me and wrenched me then in six or seven wrenches of my body and brain, you the living wrench which winched the wrenches. Later, you would do that without God, with boys, with kisses, and later you'd become an instrument of love's music. Today, I saw your portrait for the first time, your dorsal vein, your artery, your cavernous body, your vestibular bulb, your suspensory ligament, and I could see how evolution got the idea from you to invent an organ something like you, but a lot bigger. You were named for a Greek hill, Clinine, a slope. You are the ground of our being, the tiny figure of the human, the hooded stranger who comes to the door. And if we bless her, we will be blessed. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> no makeup. Maybe one reason I do not wear makeup is to scare people. If they're close enough, they can see something is different with me, something unnerving 
as if I have no features. I am embryonic, pre-eyebrows, pre-eyelids, pre-mouth. I am like a water bear talking to them or an amniotic traveler, a vitreous floater on their own eyeball, human ectoplasm risen on its hind legs to discourse with them. And such a white, white girl, such a sickly toadstool, so pale, a visage of fog, a fizz of mist above a graveyard, no magenta roses, no floral tribute, no goddess, no grown-up woman, no acknowledgement of the drama of secondary sexual characteristics, just the gray matter of spirit talking, the thin features of a gray girl in a gray graveyard, granite, ash, chalk, dust. I tried the paint, but I could feel it on my skin. I could hardly move under the mask of my desire to be seen as attractive in the female way of 1957, and I could not speak. And when the makeup came off, I felt actual as a small mammal in the woods with a speaking countenance or a basic primate having all the expressions which evolved in us to communicate. If my teenage acne had left scars, if my skin were rough instead of soft, I probably couldn't afford to hate makeup or to fear so much the beauty salon or the very idea of beauty ship. And my mother was beautiful. Did I say this? In my small eyes and my smooth withered skin, you can see my heart. You can read my naked lips. Okay. Oh, good. Two more. Ode to the hymen. Ode to the hymen. I don't know when you came into being inside me when I was inside my mother. Maybe when the involuntary muscles were setting like rose jello. I love to think of you then, so whole, so impervious, you and the clitoris as safe as the lives in which you were housed. They would have had to kill both my mother and me to get at either of you. I love her at this moment as the big fortress around me, the matron head around the sweet meat of my maidenhead. I don't know who invented you to keep a girl's inwards clean and well cupboarded. Dear wall, dear gate, dear style, dear Dutch door, not a cat flap nor a swinging door, but a one-time pinata. How many places in the body were made to be destroyed once? You were very sturdy, weren't you? You took your job seriously. I'd never felt such pain. You were the hourglass lady. <coughs> <coughs> I'd never felt such pain. You were the hourglass lady, the magician. <laughs> I never felt such pain. You were the hourglass lady, the magician saws in two. I was proud of you, turning to a cupful of the bright arterial ingredient. And how lucky we were, you and I, that we got to choose when and with whom and where and why, plush pincushion, somehow related to statues that wept. It happened on the rug of a borrowed living room, but I felt as if we were in Diana's woods, 
he and I and you together, or as if we were where the magma from the core of the earth burst up through the floor of the sea. Thank you for your life and death. Thank you for your flower girl walk before me, throwing down your scarlet petals. It would be years before I married, years before I carried within me a tiny baby hymen near the eggs with other teensy hymens within them. But you unscrolled the carpet, leading me into the animal life of a woman. You were a sort of blood mother to me. First you held me close for 18 years, and then you let me go. And I'll close, I always say that clothes, as if I'm now gonna put my clothes back on. I'll close with this poem, Ines and I have spoken about it, the difficulty in its translation. Um, but I always close with this poem now. And with my thanks to all of you for welcoming me there where it is your home and where I uh, am honored to be present. This poem is called, For You. In the morning, when I'm pouring the hot milk into the coffee, I put the side of my face near the convex pitcher to watch the last round drop from the spout. And it feels like being cheek to cheek with a baby. Sometimes the orb pops back up, a ball of cream balanced on a whale's watery exhale. Then I gather the tools of my craft, the cherry sounding board tray for my lap, like the writing arm of a desk, the phone, the bird book for looking up the purple martin. I repeat them as I seek them so as not to forget tray, cell phone, purple martin, Trey, Phone, Martin, Trayvon, Martin, Song was invented for you. All art was made for you. Painting, writing was yours, our youngest, our most precious, to remind us to shield you. All was yours, all that is left on earth with your body was for you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you.